So this is, does APL need a type system? And really, you know, Snoyman did my job for me. I don't, you know, I can, we can leave now. <laughs> We're done. We're good. Uh, but no, actually, so a, a little bit about me first. I'm Aaron Su. I am a PhD candidate at Indiana University, funded through Dialogue, AP, uh, Dialogue Limited. And I, in a previous life, I spent about eight to nine, maybe 10 years as a scheme programmer. And I was on the R7RS uh, language small working groups, designing the language and working on standardizing it. That was, eh. <laughs> uh, I'm a compiler writer by trade. I taught the uh, compilers course at IU for a little bit because I got tricked by Kent Dibvig. So when we talk about the lineages, uh, Kent Dibvig has, is sort of my research lineage, if you will. And, um, you know, I, I also want to thank our previous illustrious speaker for bringing back all the most important things I wish everybody knew about. Axiomatic semantics, linear algebra, you know, proof derivation. Like this is, this is I, I actually also implemented a um, small axiomatic semantics for task parallelism on top of APL. So this was one of my, I, I'm, this kind of formal verification is my favorite sort. And uh, after Scheme, I started doing APL. And I still, if I can't use APL, I use Scheme for any problem that APL doesn't work for, and I haven't written a line of scheme in seven years or so. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, the two languages couldn't be more different in some sense. Uh, so we'll get into that. But this talk, this talk is specifically about my experiences with APL. And this talk is also going to be a high level talk. So APL is a high level language. This talk is high level. We're not going to teach you how to do APL. If you want to learn how to do APL, go to the workshop later this afternoon, and then go to work the workshop tomorrow. We're going to get hands-on, deep and dirty with the uh, APL code, and you'll actually learn to play with some stuff. Here, we're not talking about that. We're talking about bigger ideas, bigger fish, that kind of thing. So APL at a high level, uh, what are we dealing with there? Um, well, uh, sorry, just want to get something going. So APL at a high level, one word to describe it. This is, this is really about how it seems to most people. Similar to the experience a lot of people have when they first see lazy uh, evaluation in Haskell. It's like, what's going on, you know? And so magic is an interesting concept in itself. And APL to some people is a light to lighten the Gentiles, if you will. And to other people, it's more of thou shalt not commune with the spirits of the dead. So, but regardless of which side you fall on, Everybody will agree that compared to the rest of the computing industry, APL is pretty weird. Uh, maybe less weird than it used to be, but it is still pretty weird. And APL is the granddaddy of functional programming. We were, we were hacking on uh, live terminal sessions and doing functional programming before it was cool and before we had CRT screens on, a, you know, selectric typewriters. So, you know, we have a strong history of APL uh, in functional programming, but it's entirely different than mainstream. And nowadays, we have mainstream functional programming. And mainstream functional programming is something very different than what we think of the functional programming in APL to a degree. There's a lot of overlap, but nowadays, functional programming is almost synonymous with strongly typed static programming languages. It's not strictly true. The, the scheme guys will vehemently oppose that and say that we're functional programmers too, and then use setbang. Uh, but you know, it's, it is what it is, but the, the, this has led to this question that I get all the time when people see APL and they go, oh, cool, can we put a type system on that? Or do we want a type system? Or why don't you have a type system? Or I would use APL if only it could provide me with type system stuff. And so, again, another spoiler alert, I'm going to tip my hand here. Yes, yes. Does APL need a type system? Oh, yeah, yeah, it would be great. It'd be wonderful. I would love it. But you'll be sorry. The day that APL gets a usable type system, you will be sorry, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and somebody will be crucified. And why is this? Because I don't think when people are asking that question of what does APL need a type system, they're actually talking about improving APL as a language. I think what they're actually looking for is validation. It's a bit of the sunk cost fallacy. Is they're trying to say, well, I'm used to thinking about things with a type system. Type system is good. Why don't we have one? And there's a bit of this question. I think people, there's a social issue going on here as well, not just a technical one. 
And keep in mind that my background in my PhD, I also did my minor, in, my undergrad minor was an accidental mathematics minor. Uh, so I didn't intend to get it, I just accidentally picked all math courses as my electives and they said you should do a minor. And I did HCI as my minor in my PhD program. So this should give you some context here as I'm very focused on user experience uh, and design in the learning sciences, education, that sort of thing. So I, I do think that, to get back here, the, the issue a little bit is, is how, how much we uh, you know, want to attach ourselves to things that we think are more common or are, that we're used to. But if APL gets a type system, it's only going to get weirder. It's not going to look more familiar. A good APL type system is just going to be weirder and make the language stranger than you ever thought. It's not going to bring you closer to the language. And so why would we even want a type system? We've got to ask this question because I think people forget, right? And so why? Does anybody you know, think about this for a second? You don't have to scream it out right now. But let's think about what the answer should be. And think about viscerally, what is your reaction if you said, why do you need a type system? This is the right answer. This is not really a joke. This is the right answer in most communities. And the truth is that type systems have proven themselves over and over and over again in the community. And to the point where there is even some small degree of usability HCI research that sh provides preliminary evidence to suggest that type systems provide a real advantage in the languages in which we're seeing them used. Right? So I'm not anti-type system at all. Um, this is really the right answer. So let's flip the question around. Why might we not want a type system? And this goes back to APL being weird. Because all of the research, all of our experience with type systems are in languages that feel very, very, very different from APL. So it's possible that there's something about APL that makes it unsuitable for a type system. And so in order to dig into that a little bit more, we need to ask ourselves, why do we want a type system again? What is it about the type system that we're going for? And unfortunately, the reality in a lot of the world, especially the research community doing some of the best, inter most interesting stuff in types, is, well, we do types because of types, right? And this is not a bad reason. This is a perfectly legitimate reason to do research on a thing because it's fundamentally interesting. That's perfectly fine. But if we're trying to think about type systems as a thing that we need, in a language, a thing that's supposed to help us for some reason. We need to get away from just studying types for their own sake. This still needs to be done. This kind of stuff still needs to be pursued. But if we're talking about the pragmatic questions, what's, what's the one word answer for why would we might want it? What does a type system give us in our language? And usually it's some variety of this. Productivity. We want productivity somehow. And type systems help to improve productivity on some level. But to understand this concept of productivity, we have to go deeper into saying, what do we mean by a type system? So let's think about that. Because type systems themselves, the word type, the word type system, it's actually a pretty broadly interpretable concept. So we need to narrow this down to what do we actually mean when we say, does APL need a type system? And so type systems generally fall under the class of static analysis things, right? And Let's think about some things that are static analysis that are not a type system. And one of the immediate ones that should come to mind are linters. Nobody really wants to say that a linter is an adequate type system, or that it's even really a type system at all. But it is a form of static analysis. So when we say specifically static type system, what do we mean? What is the actual thing that we're referencing? So in order that, so that we can be precise about what we're thinking about. And I, I have a few things that I think are important, critical, necessary features. One is that a static type system is explicit in some form. It has to have a degree of explicit feature or explicit existence in some fashion. It can't just be an entirely implicit concept in your language, right? It has to form an ex explicit form uh, on the language itself. And it has to constrain the semantics of the language. So a static type system's bread and butter is its ability to constrain the semantics of the language and restrict it. And if you're in HCI, you know constraints are good. You want to constrain yourself because that allows you to explore that space more efficiently. If you have no constraints on your design space, you're in serious trouble. 
And furthermore, I'm going to claim that t static type systems must involve some degree of syntactic burden, not just semantic constraint. Because you can do a lot of semantic constraints in Scheme or these other languages, but unless you layer on top some sort of syntax to talk about types in your program. Now, it doesn't mean you have to litter every single statement with a type, but it does mean that there has to be something somewhere syntactically talking about your types. If it doesn't have that, I'm claiming it's not really what we mean when we say a static type system, right? So what does this give us? What's the value proposition of a static type system? And I'm going to sell types as hard as I can right now, right? I'm going to try to convince you that you need a type system. And I'm going to do that with a trifecta, a trinity. I think types assist us in the past, in the present, and in the future. Uh, this is my, my sales pitch for types. And the way they help us in the past is that type systems provide intent, a form of formal documentation. They help us to communicate what the intent of our software was and should be. So that when we read our software, hopefully we get a better idea of what we're trying to accomplish and what the point of all this code is. Right? This is about documentation. It's about you know, in the communicating that intent. And it communicates the intent, ideally, in a way that is not necessarily communicated as efficiently, or it covers for a potential deficiency in the programming language code. In the present, it's about robustness and performance with a broad definition of performance. This could be correctness. This could be performance of execution time. This could be the efficiency with which you can refactor your code, any of this. This falls under this concept of being presently useful, so that when you're working directly on the code right now, and you need to change something, manipulate something, that type system forms that structure, a framework that helps you to ensure that that code is going to be correct, or it helps to make sure that that code that you're changing or manipulating, you can understand it a bit better, or that you have systems and tooling support that can help you to do that. And so this, for instance, is to help compilers or something like that, or anything. In the future, it's code prediction, because it is a constraint on your design space. So this is where we see things like type-directed programming or compiler-directed programming. And when we do this, this allows us to control the process of code creation in a way that helps to guide us towards a solution that we believe will be more likely to be reasonably correct. Now, a type system can't make the claim to answer your question for you. It's not going to give you the solution. But what it hopefully does is constrain the potential solution space in a way that helps you to arrive at a satisfactory solution quicker or more robustly, or something like this. We're sold, right? I mean, who wouldn't want that? I say that's good. Let's do it. This is, this is great. Like, all right, type systems. Let's do this thing. So now let's swap over, and let's look at APL. What's APL's value proposition? Well, it's intent, robustness, performance, and time to solution. We've seen this before, right? I think a couple of slides ago, if anybody's still remembering that. Um, this is almost the same thing that I, I talked about with the type system. So what's going on here? And what's going on is we're approaching these problems, because intent, robustness, performance, time to solution, these are all things we care about. But APL is addressing this through an explicitly different design motif. And that design motif was coined tool of thought by Ken Iverson, the creator of APL. And so the idea is we're not really thinking of APL as a programming language per se, right? The name means a programming language. But the, the concept is that it should be a notation that provides us with a way of thinking. And that really means that we're very, very solution oriented in the way we think about problems, the way we think about things. And so that means in order to really juxtapose or merge type systems and APL, we have to understand not only the technical context in which we exist, the semantics of our language, but we have to also understand the social context in which these languages are used, why they benefit the social groups that they work on. We need to take a sociocultural evaluation of this. And that means we need to go into the linguistic context of how we use this language in our community. And that really is an HCI problem. This is less a technical problem, but we'll get to the technical stuff. But more an issue of we need to deal with the experience that we're going for. And this is the fatal flaw in this question. Because people always assume 
a lot about what is or is not a thing, and they forget the HCI. They start thinking about the semantics. Oh, we can do this, we can do this. I can do this in this language, I can do that in language. So some of you guys are FPers in here, and we all know that FP is great, and it's also true that you can do FP and C, right? Perfectly possible, right? You can do it, it's, I mean, well, I'll claim, yeah. So now that we know that we can do FP and C, why are we using Haskell? Why do we even care about any of these programming languages? And most functional programmers should go, eh, you can, can you do FP and C? But oftentimes they don't know why they can't do FP and C because the arguments for doing FP and C are pretty strong and there's something about that that you don't want. And we can take it even further because you can kind of do functional programming in assembly too. But what is functional programming? What's the really big thing? And we gotta flip this around too because people say, oh, well I can just do APL with X language. And the world is littered with APL in language X failures. It's a common, common thing for somebody to see APL, they go in, they try to implement it, they fail. But oftentimes they won't know why they failed. Either they, and they'll project that failure somewhere where it maybe doesn't belong. And part of my claim is that APL failures occur because it's an attempt to translate something using semantics into another language when what is making APL useful is not just semantics. And this is true for functional programming too. We're not just about semantics. This is an HCI problem. Functional programming languages solve an HCI problem, not just a semantics problem. And we need to make sure that's a focus when we think about these concepts. So let's go into these proposed values. <laughs> so let's go into these proposed values, intent, right? And intent is really about readability. And who's heard me talk about readability before? After class. Yes, last year I talked about it. I ranted on it a little bit. I'll give you the brief overview here. Readability is not how comfortable you feel with seeing the source code, right? This is, goes back to Snoyman's on-ramping thing. This is not just about how easy you could on-ramp yourself. This is about expert level confidence in your code. And I measure this by the one a bet concept, which is how much are you willing to bet monetarily your risk that a change you're about to make to the code will work the first time without referencing any mechanical aid whatsoever. Because we're thinking about readability here. And readability is about how well you can understand what your source code is doing visually and looking at it, reading it. Not necessarily the use of external tools to do it. And the type system community tends to leverage abstraction in order to accomplish the enhanced readability on some level. So are you saying, let's take the semantic of semantic No, because if you do the HCI research, you find that humans are fundamentally good at ignoring those sort of details, and so parentheses are a non-issue. The parentheses do not usually negatively affect that bet. That's not the reason people might be scared to change a piece of Lisp code. Right, but you notice that probability is A little bit, a little bit. If we do the F. But it depends, but it depends. So we can go into that in more detail towards the end. That's an interesting question. If we look at the APL's approach to dealing with readability, we solve this problem in a diametrically opposed way, which is directness. And the reason we approach it this way is something that somebody pointed out, and I think is universally true, naming is hard, right? And more than just that, there's a reason we don't, we're judicious with our names in natural language, right? Imagine if every single time you referred to anything, you had to give it a proper name. That's what we're telling our programmers to do very often. This is something that's not easy for humans to do because it vastly increases the dictionary size of our language. And that makes it, and it can be difficult. Now types, are a type of structural name. They're a type of summary or co uh, con condensation or concision of a broader idea in a form of a structure that communicates some amount of information that we want that helps to identify that piece of thing that we're working with. Uh, maybe it defines a set of things that we're working with, like table uh, is a word that sort of defines a set of possible things. But types are structural names. Now, what happens when we introduce names is we increase the distance metrics in our code. That's both semantic distance in terms of abstractive indirection, and that's syntactic distance by the actual introduction of syntactic elements inside of our software. 
And Edward Amsden, uh, Haskeller, FRPer, user of Idris at one time, and a uh, colleague that spent some time at IU with me, now he's professionally a Haskeller, he had this to say about it. Abstraction means that the code that does what you want isn't where you think it is. We can think about this for a second. All right, so now let's take it some names and some APL code. Don't worry about understanding the APL code, just ponder the intuition here. Because each of these lines of APL code is a complete implementation of the idea specified in this name. Not a partial implementation, a full, complete expression of the entire solution down to the metal where we can fully understand what's going to happen. There are no open questions anymore with this. So we got some of the multiples of three and n, or three and five. So here's one question. Do we want to count multiples that are both multiples of three and five twice or just once? That's not answered in that name. It's answered in the APL code. Prime numbers from zero to n, this is three different versions. How about connected components on a graph? Game of life? Two different implementations. Okay. But, you know, everybody says, oh, well, so APL is good for computation, good for linear algebra, good for math, but you can't really do your cool recursive tree stuff, right? Well, I mean, read my dissertation, but how about we delete nodes inside of a tree by name? Or how about we create a binding table for lexical lookup in environments? for our ASTs. How about we remove binding chains from inside of that environment? Nope, this is all real production code that's in the compiler or otherwise. Or maybe we want to check whether a variable matches its found binding. How about we look up variables inside of our lexical scopes? How about we go through and find our variable and binding references and then col collapse reference chains that are too long? So if we have a variable referring to a variable referring to a variable referring to a function, let's just make sure all those variables refer to the function. There we go. All right, quiz. Type the above. The easy one is how do you type the characters? That's a keyboard IME. It's, uh, it comes by default on your Linux machine. Uh, set XKB map dash lang of uh, US and APL uh, dash variant comma uh, dialog dash option uh, GRP colon L switch. There you go. You can uh, now type APL symbols with your left alt key as an alt GR key. But what if we wanted to actually statically type these using a, a type system? What did that look like? Think in your heads. What would the type signature for something like that be? I mean, obviously, we could go the scheme route and just say array to array. That's a type. It's an accurate type. Is it useful in any way? No. So we need something richer. But what is going to state a useful information about these invariants? The names capture a little bit of what we want the type to say. right? A, a good type system should communicate some of that information, hopefully structurally and formally rather than just with names. right? Uh, lest we fall down the ch pitfalls of C++, what are they called, intentions, structures, that extra meta layer of names on top of things. Um, so the question is, would any type signature that we come up with in a currently understood type system actually be a fundamental improvement to that line of code? Does it really give us a benefit? Or is it just making our code more complex and just mucking about with the readability? So another way to think about this, maybe APL is just a type system. We've just eliminated the term level problem and we're just programming directly in our type system. This sounds insane, but there's some evidence to back this up because APLers regularly compute over the things that most people would consider type level entities in their other programming languages. Here's a few. These are all computable things in our, we do arbitrary computation on these objects. Normally in a statically typed functional programming language, these things are reserved for type level 
things, uh, type level objects that very often are highly restricted in how you can use them. So this should remind us of something. In Lisp, we have the you know, quippy term, code is data. Well, maybe in APL, we need to introduce the term types are data. And of course, that leads us back to thinking about dependent types, and that's very cool research. But there's also another thing. This has been understood since the 80s. So Lenare Mullen's dissertation on mathematics of arrays provides an axiomatic semantics of arrays using APL as the proof language and the proof system to do reasoning about programs and about problem solutions using array, basically rationalized APL. And we do this kind of stuff to our types. So TYP is a, is a type of type. It's a tag inside of our enumerations. And it might also be part of an ADT if you were doing this in um, another type language. And we've just negated a type. And we've also added to a type. And those have meanings in type systems to some degree, but they mean something very different here. Uh, we're doing some very interesting computation on these because we're changing the actual underlying representative value, not just altering and creating a new structural type. And so if we look at the types that we might want, say in a dependently typed APL language, that describes in a meaningful, interesting way the constraints we care about for these single lines of APL code, the types end up being larger. So I've got a new type system for Haskell. That type system produces types. You, when you put your type signature on your program, it's going to be between three to seven times larger and bigger than the program code that you're typing. Is that a good type system for Haskell? Do you want that? So in APL, I actually did this. I took an axiomatic semantics approach to typing APL using a variety of whore logic and did essentially a dependently typed APL and wrote the types out and saw what I would have to write. Most of the time, those types were insanely long, probably between three to five and seven times longer and more complex structurally than the APL line that we were typing. And it was not usable. So this is also a known problem in the types research community. APL typing is research level hard. Look at uh, Alan Shiver's work with some other people. I'm blanking on the names now. But there, there has been some research out there trying to type APL and achieve good rank polymorphism. But the problem is those type systems are A, not usable, and B, not even close to capable of fully expressing the semantics inside of a current trivial APL system. So we're a long ways away from figuring out even what we need to do with those types, much less make them a usable language like Haskell, right? So let's go to our next question, robustness and performance. Well, with types, essentially, we're getting a theorems for free or infinite tests, right? We're sort of eliminating a whole class of things that the compiler is going to do for us. And that's both for correctness and for performance. And by refactoring or by providing these things, we get nice, nice, good factoring. So what we're doing is we're using the type system to provide mechanical assistance to us to not let us worry about a certain problem, right? And this is a useful thing. So story time. Once upon a time, Free was feeling down. Nobody liked him. No one liked to call him. But GC came to find him. And GC promised to take care of him. GC took him to a tower filled with joyful boys and girls, and everyone was building happy memories. And GC promised Free that he could play and share memories, too. But Free didn't notice through all the boys and girls queuing for events that the name of the tower was Node.js. And for those of you who didn't get that, uh, a Node.js programmer I saw with I can, I'm sure I can find his quote. He said something like, it's not a real Node.js program without an unmitigated rampant memory leak uh, just taking your software down that can't be found. So tune in next time for the perils of lazy pars paralyzing parallelization. So what are we talking about here? And this is a danger in mechanical guarantees. If 
you go too big picture, you might, be a, might lose the ability to reason about the small details and destroy your performance. But if you stay too far in the low details, you might have usability issues with thinking about problems because you have too many abstractions that you have to build up. So what you want is a language that allows you to reason about the little details without worrying about them and see the big picture without getting lost and making bad architectural decisions. So APL is really high level on some sense. And it's really high level because oftentimes you need almost no abstraction to solve the problem you're trying to solve. It just gets a direct expression in APL. It's almost ultra instinct high level though because not only do these APL programs show you know, good high level behavior, they're also remarkably mechanically sympathetic. And that means that their cost model is directly related to the modern architectures of our machine. When you write good APL code, they are almost like writing C code for the 70s level CPU architectures. Good APL code is data parallel and maps very, very well to our SIMD and vector architectures and our memory architectures that are currently extant on modern CPUs and GPUs. That's why you know, my, my big research was a data parallel compiler that's designed to self-host on the GPU. And it does that without any branching or recursion or if statements or looping or pattern matching or any of that. And that's because APL allows me to express those solutions in a way that's data parallel by construction and maps to those architectures efficiently. But I'm not the only one who says stuff like this. Martin Thompson, he came and gave a talk last year, right? And he says, functional data structures are like sausages. The more you see them being made, the less well you will sleep. Anybody who's in closure should know this. Functional data types will save the world if we can only get them to work. Uh, and, you know, this is another quote. I don't care what data structure you use, nothing beats an array. And people who have to get real stuff done real fast and have to iterate quickly, this is the kind of thing they say. And when it comes to arrays, or matrices, or anything like that, nothing beats APL. So, one of the reasons is shorter code is easier to debug. Arthur Whitney says this, but some people consider Arthur Whitney a total kook, absolutely crazy, genius level insanity, so maybe he doesn't count. Well, our, our own Michael Snoyman said this in the keynote yesterday. We've got a lot of very maintainable code there that we just showed. Because not only does it not even need a whole slide, I could fit all of that on one slide and it's maintainable, right? Easy to go. And this gets at something really important from an HCI perspective in the human mind. The more you can see, the more you can know. And this is actually almost a proportional relationship or something like that. But it's important to understand the limits. And so we're not talking about just shrinking our code size a little bit. We need to th talk about shrinking our code sizes by orders of magnitude, because unless you do that, you're not going to reap the benefits. If you can't shrink your code drastically, you're not gonna see as nearly as much of a benefit. Saving 20 lines here, 20 lines there, out of a 100 or you know, 200,000 line program, that's not really gonna do it. But if that 100,000 line program suddenly became a 1,000 line program, now we're talking. And one of the ways that APL does this is that it's very general. And that means that the code that we wrote up behind there was rank polymorphic. That was part of the difficulty of typing it. But we're general in a very specific way, right? And this generality, when we apply it correctly, allows us to get faster iteration, really fast iteration on our problems. And this allows us to solve problems in what I would call a hyper-agile way because we can iterate on multiple solution spaces very, very, very fast. And one of the things that we can do because of this is oftentimes APLers will have code memorized. And do not underestimate the value of being able to memorize large pieces of non-trivial computations. Because when the human mind gets to work, if that knowledge is externalized, it does not become as deep. It's not as useful to you. But if you can internalize that knowledge into your brain where it can sit around, you've got that deep knowledge. And now this can affect everything that you're doing and everything that you're thinking. And now we can begin to see why we think of APL as a tool of thought. And additionally, to maximize this, we want to optimize for whole program rewrite. Be willing to delete all of your code, or at least design your architecture so that you're not very afraid of losing the whole thing. 
And if you can do this, or if you push towards this, it's one of the ways the APLers work to remove technical debt. Because every time you see something, the technical debt is more painful than rewriting the thing. So we shift the, the value proposition down. And you can see why this maybe conflicts a little bit with what we're, other stuff is doing. So let's look at compiler analysis. Well, if our code is written in the way that good APL is written, and I've done some of this, stuff that takes research papers to describe for solving problems in these type languages is literally trivial for any practical situation in APL. And we didn't need the types to do it. And so this can simplify optimization, not only with our compilers doing things, and thus make our compilers simpler and more robust, and that we can handle higher level problems, but human level optimization becomes easier. Because reasoning about that code is easier, and thus we now have something that allows us to make good high level architectural design decisions and think about macro problems to eliminate you know, inefficiencies. But this requires being able to break our abstractions. This is critical. So let's go into code prediction. That's type-directed programming or other stuff like that. And this is basically a funnel method of doing our work. We start with a broad set of possibilities and we funnel it down to what we want. And the human mind is not particularly good at this, so we use compiler support to do this, right? And systems tooling support to help us get this benefit. And so it's not really quite human optimized. So what do we look at as the alternative in APL? Here's some APL code. This is APL code that I actually was writing. And this APL code is broken. It's not typing. It's not even valid APL code. And moreover, it contains probably between three to five different potential implementations of this code. So this was me trying to solve a problem. So rather than going type directed, I went undirected. Like a giant Tetris puzzle that I pick and choose what isn't going to work until the pieces all just fall together. And so what I had here was a bunch of things that are potentially interrelated. And because I could have all of them on the screen all at once, it allowed me to see and think about all the potential ramifications of each of the potential solutions. But if this were a less, a more verbose system, I wouldn't be able to visually see how this all fits together and fit the pieces like Lego blocks. And this is one of the concepts of suggestivity in APL that Iverson talked about in his paper, Notation as a Tool of Thought. And that's a fountain approach instead of a funnel approach. So where the type-directed programming gives us a funnel, the fountain gives us something called serendipitous transfer. And serendipitous transfer allows us to discover serendipitously applications for prior knowledge that were in domains that seem like they're unrelated. This is cross-domain optimization. And this is possible only because we have short code, they share a common foundation, and their abstractions are breakable, meaning we have transparent implementations. And this allows us to empower our existing knowledge, and we do so in a way that's visual and maps to the pattern recognition capabilities of the human mind. And we can do this because we have concretized domain overlap. So what does that mean? That means that our domains are not just abstractly related, but that we have a concrete way in which they're fundamentally re related. And I, just, I had a moment like this the other day while I was working on some stuff. I was uh, working out a checkerboard, you know, studying a checkerboard problem. And this one, you know, this gives us uh, this picture here. It's just a little checkerboard, right? But it didn't, it didn't feel satisfactory to me. Something felt off about it. So I was like, okay. We can actually do it like this, to get the same thing. And the important thing to think about here is I was studying, uh, oh, let's see if we can go back here. Yeah, there we go. I was studying, uh, all right, I'm just gonna try to point here. This piece of code here, right? And that piece of code gives you this. I thought, ooh. This, this, something in the back of my head was going, ooh, this is, this reminds me of something. What does this remind me of? I'm on checkerboard, mind you. I'm thinking about checkerboards, trying to solve it. And I was thinking, oh, I know what this is. This is just like the walking distance between nodes and the paths of an AST. Why? Well, because I had studied this problem with, uh, on APL Orchard, and somebody had produced this solution, which has this really visually distinctive piece right here. Flip, grade up, grade up, flip. It's sort of stuck in my mind. It's like, that is a really interesting technique. That's an idiomatic technique. It's kind of like, whoa, what was that? And then I thought, this, this, this 
that, if we take that, and, and then if we combine it with this, what do we have? Does anybody know? I mean, because it's obvious, right? We have a proof that the rationals are countable. And so how did this happen? Well, it happened, and, and notice that this is all trivial. This is the fundamental concept of the proof of the rationals are countable. That is the diagonalization proof, if anybody wants to study that one, right? And the reason we did this is because we were able to reuse this code in a serendipitous way and transfer it around. And we jumped across domains because we could see the patterns across those domains. Those techniques worked across those domains. And this is code reuse. And where the type system approach achieves code reuse through abstraction, which forms a sort of hiding of information, we try to achieve code reuse through transparency. And that transparency provides us this ability to do this stuff. So FP, what do the FPers say? Well, types help you document your code. Absolutely true. APLers say, well, just write clearer, shorter code. And the FPR goes, well, types help correctness. And the APL goes, well, just write clearer, shorter code more often. And the FPRs go, well, types help performance. And the APLer goes, well, just rewrite clearer, shorter code more often with a mechanically sympathetic language. And the FPR goes, well, types help you write new code more vigorously. This is type-directed programming. And the APLer says, well, just rewrite clearer, shorter code more often with a mechanically sympathetic language that optimizes suggestivity to reuse idioms in more places. Easy. And so, of course, then the APLer goes, but types! Types, man! And the APLer goes, but APL! And so, in closing, we'd love a new type system. I totally want to see a type system for APL. Do you guys have one that's more economical than APL? Thank you. And I don't know if we have any time for questions. Oh, yay. I, I love questions. Please, go. Um, we've also got one over here, so Hello. go ahead. Yeah, uh, one question. How to explain all this to a college graduate or a professor? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, how to explain all this to a college graduate or a professor? Ms. Fraser how? Is, how to explain APL to a professor? Somebody is just passed out uh, from the college. Oh, how do you explain yeah. APL to somebody who's new? Yes. Um, uh, do you have prior programming experience? Um, just uh, like C, C++, basic computer science graduate. I'm sorry then, that's a real hard problem. Uh, no, no, so in truth, if you don't have any prior programming experience, APL is trivial to teach. It's very, very easy to teach a non-programmer or a scientist, PhD, uh, physicist, any of that, easy to teach them APL. The moment you come out of a graduate program or even an associate's degree with the computer science on that plaque, you like suddenly become unable to understand APL. And uh, this is a really hard problem, and it's one that I've been working on because part of my research agenda is the learning sciences aspect of computing. And so I'm very interested in how do we teach something like this to other people. And this is why, for instance, last year I gave that talk on design patterns versus anti-patterns. And that's why the short workshop, Array-Oriented Functional Programming, this afternoon is going to cover some of that. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at the core toolbox, that the assumptions that you make with functional programming that just are taken as fundamental uh, basic tools that you're just used to using. And the problem is, is that in APL, oftentimes those are the exception, not the rule for doing things. And so you have to get used to not using those. You have to have something to replace that. So you need something to replace your if statement. You need something to replace recursion. You need something to replace pattern matching or uh, the, the type constraints or ADTs or any of this. You need techniques to say, hey, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to use something else. Because the, AP, the programmers universally struggle because they have this almost unconscious practice of thinking about problems in a certain search space. They have a search algorithm for arriving at a solution. And the APLers are sitting way over here. And they never find the solution because they're, they're going crazy on it. But yes, it's a, 
It's a tractable problem. I have a blog post, Getting Started with APL. You can go to that. It's got a whole bunch of links on what it, we're doing. But I have, a, I have an approach that I think will work in the future, and I'm trying to uh, get the textbook written specifically for people to overcome some of these humps. Um, Yes, and there's a path from FP to, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, so the, the F peers are in a better spot because you will recognize a lot of potential things. F peers are in a worse spot because they might recognize a bunch of things, right? So, yeah, yeah, so what you have to do is you have to forget everything and just accept that it's going to be a really steep first apparent curve. But once you let yourself do that, let yourself feel the pain a little bit, once you hit that, suddenly all that FP knowledge will come racing back and you'll be able to use it again. But you have to sort of forget it all for, to start with a little bit and then it'll suddenly all fit back together once you've learned it again. So it, APL is very front heavy in terms of learning, but it's, it's not very long front heavy, right? So it'll go really high and then you'll quickly get back into it, but you have to be willing to sort of in, endure that initial mental anguish. Sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, as somebody who does evangelism for, for prologue. Uh, God, you know, all of your talk was like, oh yes, 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 this is, this is exactly the pain points I'm having. And um, that leads me to the question, maybe we're both playing in a space that is larger, uh, some space of languages that are not, uh, that are not the, paradigms we're used to? I'm using paradigm in kind of a large so, sense. Are we in? Yes, yes, but are actually. Are you and I having the same problem? But, but actually, this is across the board, right? Um, everybody has this problem just to one degree or another. It's about distance and, and, and paradigms, but it's also everybody's trying to solve the same problems that we're having with programming. We're just doing it in very different ways. And the more different you do it, the harder it can be for the mainstream community to adapt to that and see it. And Prolog is one of those, right? Yeah. And you know, on the technical details, APL and Prolog are very, very different. But in terms of usability from previous programming experience, they suffer from some of the same difficulties because Prolog has such a different model, mental model, and way to engage with software compared to uh, your mainstream code. And so this, this issue is going to creep up in both of them, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I yeah, so I I wonder if like I wonder if we're all only playing on a corner of of the con computing space yet, and oh, you and yes, I definitely. happen to be people who've kind of like found little holes in some much larger space. Well, the problem is nobody is willing to do HCI research on programming languages, and we need to do that in order to better understand yeah. where those holes are. Because yeah. right now, most people program and design languages through guesswork and voodoo. We're, we're like, it makes the Chinese medicine look really, really sophisticated. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, and I would agree. I, I, I think most kind of. We're barbarian alchemists. And, and most research into the yeah. practice of software engineering does tend to resemble like education research. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, we got one over there. I was just about to add that, you know, we, we need to break for lunch, but it's amazing to see no one's leaving. <laughs> well, I'm happy to stick around and answer more questions, uh, but I don't, if anybody does want to leave for lunch, feel free. Yeah, we have provided enough food for thought, <laughs> and maybe thoughts for food, yeah. Yes, uh, so my doubt was like, uh, are there any tools out there or any research being done from a, from a HCI point of view, uh, which can kind of translate uh, some APL code into maybe like uh, English, for example? Yeah, okay, yeah, because that's a common what question. What I feel is like, uh, yeah. uh, in terms of design affordance, like yeah. say there's a light switch, which is like an on and, and off. Yeah. So immediately we can like, with respect to the physical interface, I can feel that only there's some constraint available. And that, that's what happens in a normal programming language because we use English language, like for loop or something like that. So maybe that's, that's the initial uh, you know, barrier to our understanding. Like if I see some Japanese 
symbols on the screen, like my mind simply goes off. Like, is there any research being done in? No, like even I can show some uh, Kannada language for you. Like again, your mind will not even try to understand that. So if we can kind of build some tools which will say like. So how does this light switch work? Yeah. So again, that's the skill yeah. of the design. Well, no, so yeah. this is a very yeah. common light switch in the US. Uh, people yeah. understand how to use it. Yeah. But if you come from another place, like for instance, I spent about 15 minutes figuring out what these things with the glowing light on it were yeah. in the hotel. Yeah. So that's so this the, is a, yeah, so the problem, the problem. Yeah. So this is a common thing that people come up with is as they say, well, well, can't you bring it to something that is easier for me to see? Yeah. And the problem is, it doesn't work because the, you're assuming that your problem is the symbols, and that's not the problem, okay. right? Everybody wants to latch on to why am I having trouble, and they look for what appears to be the easiest explanation for why they're having the problem. And the truth is, uh, in the studies I've, I've practiced and the, when I teach this and I track the records and things like that, the symbols are a red herring, and they're, not act, they're actually significantly more efficient to communicate the ideas not only to experts but to beginners. The problem is that you begin to shut down, and when you shut your mind down and you don't think about it anymore, you miss learning the thing that's actually causing you to break down. And so what you have to do is you have to remember that and don't be afraid of the symbols, right? Because the symbols are not what's going to be difficult. I could write that stuff up using any um, ideography or, or uh, ideographs that I wanted up there and you still wouldn't have a clue what's going on. In fact, if I translated that into three letter Haskell points free programming style, you still would have no idea what's going on, right? Because, and in fact, you'd have a harder time figuring out what's going on because that Haskell line might span 150, you know, thing, or it might be, take two or three lines, and then the patterns disappear. You have no anchor points visually for you to begin to see the patterns. And so, the, it's like mathematical notation, right? The, there's a reason we use symbols in math, and we don't write everything out with English. And there's a reason we teach people to learn those symbols rather than expecting everybody to just derive algebraic proofs by using scheme code, right? And it's, it's not going to help you particularly much to learn one set of symbology and then try to switch that symbology. It's equally difficult. Just start with the symbols and just go step by step and work through it, and it'll be much easier for you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fear that people have that isn't actually justified by the, the research. Yeah, I would second that. Like, I've attended the workshop a few years ago. The first half an hour you're like sitting in the workshop and you're like, you're never gonna make any sense out of this, <laughs> right? By afternoon you actually, you start typing and you're like, oh, did I do it or it just happened, right? Like it, it actually hits you that you're no longer thinking about the symbols, they just happen, like half a day, right? And by end of the day, you start thinking about the patterns and you start thinking, oh, this is a very different way that I'm just not used to solving. And you have that aha moment, you know, like towards the end of the day. The, the, I, I, I kind of second you that you know replacing it with something else, trying to do the same in another language will just not yeah. well. And translate. It, the sim the experience is extremely similar between these two lights. This is demonstrably, objectively a simpler light switch, but I didn't know how to use it. I was lost about it, and I was searching for the solution in a totally different space. I thought this was a reset measure for telling whether we'd blown a circuit inside of the system. So it didn't even occur to me that this was a button. But I know how to use these, no problem. But this is demonstrably, objectively more complex and harder to use. And it's just that I've been trained on one versus the other. And so I was searching for something along that line. And when I encountered this, my search space just went, died. I had nothing to work on, right? And it's the same thing with your programming languages. All right, we should wrap up. Uh, if you guys are more interested, there's one more in the afternoon, and then tomorrow, if you want to attend, there's a full day workshop as well, so yes. you can participate in that. Yes, they'll get progressively more detailed. <laughs> All right, thanks, Aaron. Thank you very much.